Welcome to the Lunch and Learn. I am very excited that we have Claudia Chapman with us today to talk about the history of mumming in New England. And our winter workshop weekend felt like the right time of the year to dig into mumming. A little bit about Claudia. Claudia was the squire of Hat City Morris, a mixed Cotswold Morris side whose members' ages spanned six decades. They dance traditional Cotswold and have also written several original dances. Hat City has been celebrating the winter solstice outdoors for 25 years with a bonfire, a horn dance, a candle dance from Brittany, various original readings, and their own mummers play. Claudia is an artist, a writer, and the author of The Winter Book, Stories, Chants, and Songs for the Yuletide Season. She was the art director for, the, for World Music Press, a publisher, of multicultural music materials for educators. In 2011, Claudia presented at the very first international mummers convention and symposium about mumming in the United States. And she's presented again in 2012 and 2021. I saw her, her presentation this year at the symposium and I am very, very excited to welcome Claudia to, to talk about um, mumming in New England. And so I'm gonna shut up and hand it over to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, this all makes it sound very serious. And I think the first and most important thing about mumming is that it's fun. People have asked me, what is a mumming play? And I've always said, well, it's a very, very funny little play about death and rebirth. Um, I started off as a Morris dancer and this led to mumming. I think that Morris dance is oh, almost like a gateway to mumming. On levels of eccentricity, Morris dancing is a little bit below mumming. You start as a Morris dancer and you end up mumming. Um, we always had ales here and I see, gee, here I'm at an ale today. And my favorite part of the ales after the dancing was of course, skit night. We loved making up skits. Skits were always so funny. And one day my friend Mornin, who was our musician said, maybe we should make up a mummer's play. So we wrote a mummer's play over the phone that day. Um, it was based on the characters of traditional mummer's plays from England, but we added some variations of our own. We didn't have a dragon costume, and my son was in a phase of being really liking cows at that, that time, so he had a cow costume. So instead of the conventional St. George and the dragon, we had the dragon bovinus. Scott, spots he was plus and scales he was minus. Um, Vanessa told me that some people have, oh, when I was a little kid, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, when it was still the punchline of most jokes before it went all artisanal and hipster. And it was very much an immigrant community. People who live there, usually your mother or your father or your grandparents, or at the very most, your great grandparents came from the old country. And the old country that my grandmother came from was England, Northern England, near Scotland. And my grandfather was Scottish. And every year on New Year's Day, she would make me come into the living room and on this little teeny tiny black and white TV set, she'd say, you have to see the mummers for luck. You know, anything that they wanted you to do, they told you it was for luck. And if they didn't want you to do it, it was for bad luck. So I'd see these Philadelphia mummers for one minute, that was all it took. And I had no idea what the heck they were. They were just these strange people in costumes. But as a Morris dancer, we went to the New York City Rebels and they had a mummers play. And that was the very first time I had seen a mummers play. And I made that whole connection. What mumming is, and I kind of fell in love. And since Vanessa has pointed out that some people don't really know what a mummer's play is, 
I'm going to call my husband in and run a couple of lines from our mummer's play just to give you the very, 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 very Reader's Digest condensed version. What happens is somebody comes in, clears the room, announces it. Then St. George meets the dragon. Then St. George meets the Turkish knight. There's a death of St. George. There's a resurrection. The end. So just to give you a sense of what our play is like, I'm going to yell, hey, Joe, come in from the other room and let's run a couple of lines. He always plays because it's done. We do ours at winter solstice. He's Horatio Snowblower because one of his favorite literary characters was Horatio Hornblower. So here he comes. <laughs> You might have to bend down a little bit so people can see oh, yeah. you. <laughs> In comes I, Horatio Snowblower, a middle-aged bald man in need of a comb over. A great transformation will take place tonight. Earth will shift on its axis and turn back to light. So brave gallants all, let me clear a wide path so the mummers can enter and make you all laugh. Come forth, St. George, don't be so proud. Address yourself to this fine crowd. And now he transforms into St. George. In comes I, St. George, a man of courage bold. With my broad axe and my broad sword, I've won three crowns of gold. And then St. George fights with the, with the dragon bovinus. In comes I, dragon bovinus, spots I am plus, scales I am minus. And St. George says, and now, I will make this. I will this dragon make. The, I, and now I will make this. And now I will this dragon make into a grade A sirloin steak. And the cow says, I'll eat your flesh, I'll drink your blood, I'll chew you up to make my cud. I tell you, this is no idle boast. I will have you for breakfast, chipped, creamed, and on toast. And then skipping forward to, this is my favorite part, where the Turkish knight and St. George have their battle, and I will be the Turkish knight. In comes I, the Turkish knight. I'll give old St. George a fright. I'll split his skull. I'll break his bone, and then I'll steal his cellular phone. I'll pinch your cheeks. I'll box your ears with my rapier wit i'll reduce you to tears oh please i'm english do remember with my sharp tongue foes i dismember i look down my nose i thrust out my chin my tisk 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 will do you in they battle for a while saint george is killed actually by his horse who kicks him in the head she's disgusted with the entire thing as she says, I borne him into many a fight, the glory should be mine by right. And then Father Christmas is, comes in and he says, oh, dark night, what have you done? Rob the life of this, my son, whose life had only just begun. Now set too soon like the winter sun. And Father Christmas decides he should call a doctor and this was written in the, I think, 1990 something. So he says, a doctor could save him this I'll wager. I'll try to reach one on his pager. And I always played Dr. Mom and said, you, sir, beat me on my pager. I hope the case is something major. And Father Christmas said, yes, I paged you on your beeper to come at once and raise the sleeper. And I came in and there were nine demons in and I fetched 10 out and I made the sleeper rise and shout with a bow of the Christmas tree saying, green in winter when all lies dead, come lay your branches at his head. Water of life, pray, be forgiving. Bring this one back to the living and St. George is resurrected. And Father Christmas said, I'll file this with my HMO. Oh, 
And no longer are they dead or ill, the time has come to pay my bill. It is America after all, we're concerned about those sort of things. And Father Christmas said, I'll file this with my HMO. They'll pay it promptly, this I know. And the punchline at the end was, they'll be sad when they discover resurrection is not covered. Um, so strangely enough, I was invited to speak in Bath, England about mumming in the United States. And with that, I'm going to share my screen and do my more formal presentation. Now that we've given you a tiny idea of what mumming is like in my kitchen and in my neighborhood. Vanessa, am I working? Good. Many Americans believe that the English enjoy a better Christmas than we do. We imagine an English yuletide rich with ancient custom, charming eccentricity, and an unbroken connection to our mythic ancestors. In this slide, or in that slide, we saw um, mummers from a medieval manuscript. England has the Druids. We have Bing Crosby. England has Avebury and Stonehenge. We have Disneyland. England has Hearn the Hunter. We have Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. England has Old Father Christmas with a crown of holly round his head. And we have the Coca-Cola Santa Claus. And this is a wonderful bit of um, English graffiti from a cathedral. It's actually St. George slaying the dragon. And here are some English mummers. Um, in England, many people consider the mummers play to be just simply a hero combat play. Um, here is an English rendition of it. And here is an American rendition of it. And here I am actually in England, mumming. I'm right there in the center. And I think I'll leave, leave the slideshow on that as I talk about mumming in New England. New England has a troubled history when it comes to Yuletide pleasure. For quite some time, it was banned outright. Christmas was a workday in Puritan Boston. The Reverend Cotton Mather warned that the burning wrath of God would be visited on anybody who made merry or even took the day off from work. Heavy fines were meted out for the crime of making mince pie. The colonial government deputized pie sniffers who spent Christmas in policing the streets for the telltale aroma of cinnamon and cloves. When pie-eating slackers are fined five shillings, a mummer might find himself clapped in the stocks or worse. Although the Puritans banned the celebration of Christmas in Massachusetts, English holiday customs, including mumming, took root elsewhere in the colonies. We know this because we keep very, very careful police records. John Smith of Philadelphia was arrested on 26 December 1702 for the crime of going from house to house, dressed in women's clothing, masked and speaking gibberish. The Philadelphia mummers point to this with pride as the first recorded arrest of a mummer in the United States. The earliest written history of English mummers in Philadelphia comes from a diary written in December 1686, wherein the writer describes a party of mummers all decked out in a most fantastical manner. They performed a rhyming skit about St. George and a Turkish knight going from door to door. This kind of blows the English idea that mumming just started in the 1700s completely out of the water. <laughs> but yes, that was in 1686. And this was an English import in Philadelphia. And they already had St. George and the Knight 
and they were going from door to door. Um, the performance would have been frowned upon because one of the very first laws in Philadelphia passed in 1682 prohibited stage plays, masks, and revels. Even in Massachusetts, laws against Christmas did not go unchallenged. By 1730, they had been struck down and misrule was restored in the great colony. Samuel Breck, who was born in 1770, tells us of the antics, a group he describes as a set of the lowest blackguards that went about in disguise on Christmas performing a St. George and the Dragon play. The only way to get rid of them was to give them money and listen patiently to a foolish dialogue between two or more of them. And he recorded some of this dialogue in 1770. See, there he lies, but ere he dies, a doctor must be had. That's the only bit of that play we have left. The English colonists practiced guising for the purpose of getting away with something, but instead of blackening their faces and donning rag coats, Americans put on war paint and disguised themselves as Indians. Washington Irving tells us of mummers and sword dancers decked out in bells and fox pelt coming to the door of manor houses in New York State. They would probably look something like these medieval mummers decked out in fox pelts and animal heads. Um, the scripts evolved to suit the new nation and instead of St. George, you might see George Washington probably the closest figure we have to a patron saint engaged in, comment, in combat. I saw a revival of an old Connecticut mummers play in which George Washington battled King George, which made a lot of sense here. A um, hundred years ago, during the great folk revival in this country, collectors traveled to the isolated Appalachian mountains where songs that had died out in Great Britain were still being sung and patterns of Elizabethan speech lived on in the local dialects. Here in England, we actually, when we moved here in the 70s, we met people who were still saying chimbley for chimney and using other archaic words. So I can only imagine what it was like in Kentucky in the 20s. Um, when Marie Campbell went collecting folk plays in the Kentucky Highlands in the 1920s, she actually came upon fragments of a mummer's play. A woman named Susan told Campbell that her grandfather had always recited the part of the Turkish night. The full play had not actually been acted out in her lifetime, but her grandfather still recited his speech as part of a yearly ritual. She had heard the Turkish, Turkish night speech so many times that she too could recite it by, by heart, but she didn't know any of the other parts in the play because she'd never actually heard the play recited. In the 1930s, a group of older people in the community actually presented an old mummer's play for Campbell, which hadn't been acted out for many years and the presenters opened up with, these, with this speech. We are now aiming to give a dumb show for to pleasure the little teacher for not going off to the level country to keep Christmas with her kin. It ain't no ways perfect the way we act out this here dumb show, but it ain't been acted out amongst our settlement for upwards of 20 or 30 year, maybe more. I reckon folks all know it are bad luck to talk with the dumb show folks or guess who they are. Now we aim to start. And then he walked out of the cabin and came back with a broom to clear the way and spoke these words. Now you've all heard probably the English version, room, room, brave gallants all, give us room to rhyme. But in Kentucky, this got turned into room, room, gallons of room. 
It was, I thought that was interesting the way brave gallants all got turned into gallants of room. In come I, old Father Christmas, welcome or not. I hope old Father Christmas never is forgot, never is forgot. And if you're interested in reading the rest of the play, you can find it in the County Index of English Folk Play Scripts. It's worth a read, if only to see how brave gallants all got turned, turned into gallants of rule. When I spoke in England the first time in 2011, everybody said, uh, what are the Philadelphia mummers about? They were totally baffled by them, as was I as a child. So I did a little bit of research because one of my good friends is from Philadelphia. So she went to the mummers or went to see the mummers every year. So this is a little bit about that. This New Year's Mummers Day parade, the New Year's Mummers Day parade from Philadelphia is probably as much a mystery to most Americans as it is to the English. At first glance, the Philadelphia mummers seem to have very little to do with English mumming. A close friend who grew up in Philly and attended the parade every year was able to give me an insider's view. The parade also goes back to the colonial, colonial era when colonists celebrated Christmas in the streets more so than in their homes. And they went from house to house and recited a few remembered lines in exchange for food and drink. There may have been a play, there were certainly costumes and disguises, and we know about this again, thanks to all of the arrest records in Philadelphia. In the 1800s, immigrants from Italy, Germany, Poland, and Scandinavia get, got in on the fun in Philadelphia, with each group bringing its own twist to the celebration. The recitations completely flew out the window, but the costumes and the face paint remained, and every year it got more and more elaborate. By the late 1800s, Philadelphia store owners actually started offering prizes for the best costumes. The first organized parade took place in 1901 and groups of mummers competed for prizes. Just as towns and villages in the old country had a strong sense of community and belonging, so did the immigrant neighborhoods. Oh, am I getting feedback? No, okay. To this day, the Mummers Clubs are linked to particular neighborhoods in Philadelphia, just like Mummers groups in England and to a lesser extent in this country are really linked to neighborhoods or areas or to Morris teams in particular. And the groups are 100% male still and their wives make elaborate costumes which are worked on for an entire year. Uh, the Italian groups who have played a major part in the parade for many year years maintain that the mummers took their name from a Roman god, Momus, and that the celebration can be traced to the winter feast of Saturnalia when misrule reigned and slaves were waited on and wore their master's clothing. But what I see is uh, an American crazy quilt patched together from European traditions with a dollop of, oh, and I forgot to fast forward to the Philadelphia mummers. This is an earlier mummer and these are mummers today. And in England, I said this is more than most Americans know about the Philadelphia mummers and probably more than anybody in England needs to know. But in America, in general, um, I saw my first mummers play on the stage. And as I'm sure many of you know, there are um, coast to coast revels presentations which combine an Abbott's Bromley horn dance, a mummer's play, Morris dancing, and a variety of wonderful contra and folk dance traditions. We love them. So we're the reverse here. We've got mummer's plays on the stage and people like myself in New England saw the play on the stage and then brought it back into the streets where it 
really, really belongs. The English found this fascinating that you do mummers plays on stage. It's an entertainment that people pay money to go see. Um, the original Rebels is based in Cambridge and the very first Rebels production had a medieval English theme and it included a mummers play, a sword dance, country dances, traditional carols, recitations, and our own version of the Abbot's Bromley horn dance. The theme of the Rebels changes every year and from city to city. Each of the seven cities selects a different ethnicity to explore, local Morris dancers, folk dancers, singers, and musicians volunteer to perform side by side with a handful of professionals. And at least the people I know that have been in the, in the Rebels considered a great honor when their Morris team was asked. And it's a mingling of Yuletide lore and music from many countries built around an English core. And this makes a great deal of the United, sense in the United States because we are such a, oh, just a wonderful mix of cultures from all around the world. And where's John Langstaff? Oh, here's John Langstaff. Um, I met him once and he was the founder of the Rebels. He's probably what we call the father of American mumming. I met him at um, Nomad, a music festival where he was speaking and I told him about how we were doing mumming in our home and out on the streets. And he was so excited and he took my hand and he said, oh, what you're doing is so important. So I felt kind of blessed by Langstaff. He just thought it was wonderful that we were doing it in the street again and in our living rooms. Langstaff said that he saw mumming as a way of keeping a bit of the human spirit and the human story alive. The yearly repetition of an old familiar story rekindles our connection to a story the seasons tell of the mystery of death and rebirth. There's a need for art that connects us to each other. You go far enough back in any culture and you find these rituals, these ways of bringing people together. Connectedness is so important. It always has been. You know, this is what the rituals tell us. This is what the rebels are really all about. Langstaff was born on Christmas Eve into a family of mus musicians, and he grew up singing mummers, seeing mummers plays performed in the living room. Um, his career was so distinguished and so vast that I'll just say that he was a brilliant musician and a very gentle man, and I've actually never heard an unkind word said about him. In 1957, he produced a Christmas mask of traditional rebels in New York City, and Langstaff was recruited by NBC to create a similar program in 1966 for national broadcast. And this is my favorite bit of trivia. In the 1966 Mummers play that was on NBC, Dustin Hoffman played the dragon. I, I've been trying to find that, but I'd love to see Dustin Hoffman playing the dragon. And in 1971, he produced the first Christmas Rebels in Cambridge at the Sanders Theatres. And it was originally known as the Christmas Rebels and it evolved into the Rebels, a celebration of the winter solstice. Um, everybody loves the Rebels. Um, they always jump up on the stage uh, when Lord of the Dance is played, the audience it's strange, if you've never been to a revel, it's almost like a village up on the stage. Everybody knows what to do. Oh, they're gonna sing Lord of the Dance and we know what to do. We're gonna jump in and dance with them. And oh, we're gonna sing along with this, with this song or with that song. Everybody knows what, would, what was happening. And if they did not have the horn dancers, people would just be up in arms. Um, 
I've seen Arabic rebels, Balkan rebels, Irish rebels, Scottish rebels, Midsummer rebels, winter rebels, medieval rebels, Renaissance rebels, Bavarian rebels, and several English rebels. In the stage rebels, St. George almost always dies by the sword of the sword team. St. George shall come and die by swords which circle round his neck as winter dies, so shall he die and rise again as spring. And after St. George is brought to life, he speaks these words. Good morning, gentlemen, as sleeping I have been, and I've had such a sleep as the like has never seen. But now I am awake, alive unto this day. The dancers shall have their dance and the doctor take his play. One of my favorite rebels had a Bavarian theme. In the Mummer's play that year, the doctor traveled from Vienna and was named Dr. Freud. The play contained all of the traditional elements with the twist of having a doctor of psychology who raised St. George and then analyzed the problem of death and resurrection at the same time. And the Bavarian rebels introduced us all to the Perchten. These are the wild elemental mountain spirits like a mountain blizzard or a field of alpine flowers the Perkton are neither good nor bad, they're simply ugly or beautiful. I'm going to get to the Perkton a little bit later. In the Mummer's play I saw in Massachusetts in 2011, the character of St. George did not appear at all. He was replaced by a character named Solis, and here is Solis who clearly represented the sun. I'm not at all sure that I approve, and I certainly heard grumbling in the audience when we realized there would be no St. George. It's one thing to kill St. George, we do that every year, but it's quite another to kill him off entirely. Um, in the United States, the battle between St. George and the Turkish knight has come to be seen as a struggle between darkness and light. And in many of the plays I've seen, and indeed in our own Mummer's play, we really do see St. George as a representation of the sun. The English thought this was the strangest thing they'd ever heard. Um, a lot of them, at least the more scholarly among them, maintain that the Mummer's play is strictly a hero combat play that was created in the 1700s and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the sun. I think in the United States we probably made the connection with the death and rebirth of the sun at winter solstice because it filled the need. We needed that story. It was a story that was necessary. Um, and we have a very different relationship to St. George. If you're in England, he's the patron saint of the country. You see him all over the place. He's on stained glass windows. He's peeping out of cathedral corners. And he is representative of a hero and something that's a connection to the ancestors. In the United States, you're most likely to see St. George in, as an Orthodox church icon. He just doesn't have the same meaning. So I think it was very natural for us to make the connection with the rebirth story of the sun. But after being in England a little bit, I actually see, well, I'll go back to my written notes here. Um, as the children of immigrant families, we needed a connection to our ancestors. It appears that we would have reinvented mumming to fill this need. It may have been a reenactment originally, but it's becoming a living, tra living tradition. And St. George is currently seen as a symbol of the sun, but that could change too. After visiting England and seeing their place and speaking to people, I started to realize that he was a spirit of vegetation, which dies off each year and is reborn in spring. 
like St. Martin, Sinterklaas, and all of the other characters who ride in with the winter storms, and he rides a snow white horse. Um, that makes a lot more sense to me, but either way, we need a story about the sun, so we created one. Scholars can only date the Mummer's plays as we know them back to the 18th century. I respect this, but I believe that folk characters usually have one, more than one layer of meaning. St. George has certainly been around longer than that. Like the sun, he rose up in the east. The name George comes from the Greek name Georgios, Georgios which is translated as farmer, but which literally means worker of the earth. The green man is often called Green George, suggesting a connection. And I've come to think that St. George going as far back in history as we can is a reminder of Green George and the mystery of life and death in the agrarian year, which so many of us have become distanced from. And in the end, he willingly surrenders to the sword. Um, coming back to America, uh, many of the tribal nations of Indians in the Southwest celebrate the winter solstice as a sacred season for coming into balance. It's a time for letting go of anger and resolving differences. They believe that in restoring harmony with themselves, that balance is restored to the universe and the rains come in season and the crops grow. And they have ancient bits of story and recitation, which are all completely committed to memory. Uh, they don't write them down. One part of the tribe learns one bit, another part of the tribe learns another bit, and they all come together and put it together, restoring the whole. And now getting into some more, oh, here we are. Here's our mummer's play in Danbury. Um, that's Martin in the front, and there I am behind him with my antlers on. We actually made the newspapers because we were performing in the train stations and outside there's our Turkish knight, my niece Laura, and battling with St. George. Uh, this is from a very wonderful production up in near Deerfield, Massachusetts called Welcome Yule every year they do. Uh, it's more of a hometown revel. It's not officially connected with the revels. It's more hometown and more homespun. And the Morris team and the local singing group and the contra dancers all get together and put it on. And this was uh, 2019. I drove up to see it and they had wonderful magical pups. This is our very first Mummer's play, which was performed up in the attic of my house. That's my son as the dragon bovinus. And the little tiny person next to him was our friend Dougal, who played the dragon's tail. Here we are in, I think, 1996. We were Morris dancing and doing a Mummer's play in the railroad station. Um, Father Christmas still has his Christmas hat on. This was a, um, a stick dance. Our team was down to five members. So we wrote dances for five people. This was called Pilgrim's Progress. And here is our Turkish knight and Father Christmas um, with St. George dead on the ground. Uh, we now have switched the Turkish night over into the dark night rather than the Turkish night. Um, it was discussed before we performed out, would it be a problem saying the Turkish night because the Turkish night is kind of a bad guy. And I said, you know, what are the odds of us running into Turkish immigrants downtown in Danbury 
as it happened, there were a group of Turkish immigrants in the audience and they had a bit of a discussion with us about why they found the Turkish night upsetting, which I respected. And since the Turkish night really does in our play represent the winter night, it didn't matter. It was a very natural transition to turn her into the dark night. This is from the Revels, one of the earliest Revels. It's the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance. Um, something I've been very involved in, and it combines a great deal of elements of mumming. Oh. I went backwards, sorry about that. Actually, let me say something about the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance. This is, these are the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dancers in England. And this is an elk dancer that I saw down in New Mexico. I've seen the deer dance and the elk dance several times. There are tremendous similarities. The English think it's very funny that so many Morris teams and Mummers teams in the United States do the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance because in England, it's a dance that's specific to one place. And they also think it's very funny that we have this very beautiful, um, mysterious tune. They do it to songs more like Yankee Doodle, but we have, we have a real air of mysticism about the Abbot's Bromley in this country, and I love it. I've had people see it and just absolutely fall in love with it. And I think one reason is that there is this connection to dances from other cultures. Any nation that hunted had a connection to the game animals. And I think we've actually inadvertently reclaimed some truth about that dance. Scrolling back here, this is part of a celebration in Rhinebeck, New York called Sinterklaas. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam and the Sinterklaas festival combines Dutch and English customs. You can order a beer at the Beekman Arms, a colonial era inn and tavern, while you watch St. George battle the dragon. And in the evening, the Mummers Parade goes through the street as part of a spectacular community celebration. Um, the celebration is a day-long celebration. It's wild and wonderful. Every year, a specific animal is um, honored. One year it was the bees, um, right in the center of the photograph, you can see the bees. This was a puppet that I worked on. I'm a volunteer puppet maker for, for that celebration. Behind them you see the owls, I worked on those. In front of them you see the, the butterflies, I worked on those. Here are the owls. Those were some of my favorite puppets. Um, there's a play in the middle, which involves um, customs about bringing back the light from many cultures. They do a puppet version of the Abbot's Bromley. Poking Brook Morris comes and they Morris dance in the streets and they do the horn dance with their large antlers and they also do stick dancing. And let's see what more I have for slides. Did I miss anything? Oh, there's our little mummer from the pandemic time. I think that's the most important thing about mumming to me is that in our individual mumming team, it is a celebration of the winter solstice. It happens in December. We've done it for well over 25 years. We have a bonfire in the backyard. We have 
our mummers play, we Morris dance, those of us whose knees still work, we do the horn dance. It's an important celebration of the season that draws together customs that we all love. And it connects us to the earth. It connects us to the mystery. And I have no idea how long I've, I've talked about. <laughs> so I thought we could open it up to discussion or questions and I'll close my I guess I spoke for a long time. Sure. No, okay. you're doing good. If you want to hit stop share. Stop share. Okay. There we go. All right. And I'll let uh, Marguerite, do you have any any questions that you've corralled? I have not seen any questions in the chat, although there has been a lot of discussion about different versions of Mummer's plays. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask now, um, I believe you can either unmute or put a question in the chat. Or you can and let me just toss this out. What if I what if I stop the recording now for the formal presentation and then and then we can just have a, a discussion of it. Does does that sound good? That sounds good. Oh, there is one, one last little, did I drop it on the floor? Yeah, I think I lost it. Oh, well. How about this? I think I'm going to end the recording and we can continue the rest of it as an okay. informal chat. Or did you have one more point you wanted to add? There is. I think okay. it was one more little bit of Mummer's dialogue that I wanted to share. Our winter solstice celebration ends or begins with this. In comes I, we're around the bonfire, my husband comes in and he says these words. And he's in his mummer's rags. In comes I, spirit of the dark and ancient woods. By my antlers you know me, by your presence beneath the stars and moon, you show me that your desire to be here is stronger than the north wind who has driven weaker men shivering with fear to seek shelter beneath root and beam, far away from the elements in the four directions. Step away from your iPhones and LED light. Follow me through the darkness of midwinter's night. If you trust in the darkness, your path I'll make clear. For one brief shining moment, you'll know why we're all here. And then there's one more character that comes in, the bear. In comes I, the lumbering bear. You've awakened me from my slumbering lair. With your bells and your dancing and wild celebration, it's enough to awaken the whole of creation. Breathe deep now, let a yawn out. All is not as it seems. Come and share with the bears in their wild midwinter mid dream. That's what mumming is to me. It's a wild midwinter dream. And when we're doing it, somehow strangely, we know why we're all here and we feel connected. That's my final point. We can go over to discussion for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claudia.